evening. I'm with uh, Dr. Kilipatru Ramakrishna, who is the director of the Marine Policy Unit at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And uh, I'm going to be in conversation with him uh, about uh, his activities in the climate arena over, over many years. Rama, welcome. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you, Ed. Delighted. Rama, tell us a little bit about yourself. You've been in the climate business a long time. How did you, how did you start? Well, that's a very good question, Ed. I never thought that I would be spending a major part of my life on climate issues. Um, I happened to meet a scientist uh, who just then got back from Villac and Bellagio conferences in 1987. 1987? Uh, oh, yes, all that way, all that time ago. And he, uh, over a social uh, engagement, started talking about the issues that he knew about and the science behind it. And he casually threw the question at me. Well, you're an international lawyer. I was 30 at the time. <laughs> um, you are an international lawyer. Do you think we can have an international agreement on this topic? And my throwaway response was, well, we have had international agreements with a lot less scientific certainty. You know, I was just basing yeah. on what he said happened in Villac and Bellagio conferences and the kinds of people, you know, who were there. So uh, two days later, I get a phone call from him saying that, well, we would like you to come and work with us and make the case for an international agreement. I thought this was really strange, but I was tremendously excited yeah. at the prospect of starting something brand new. There was nothing there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are, of course, um, long range transboundary air pollution agreement. And by that time, the Montreal Protocol is gaining strength uh, and so on. But I thought this is really interesting because we have had international agreements until that point of time after a major environmental disaster. Yeah. But with climate, it is just a science telling us there could be a disaster if you don't get your act together. Um, so I decided to leave uh, my then institution, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and joined um, George Woodwell and the Woods Hole Research Center and began working on uh, writing a paper, just a desk study. Um, and at the end of it, he thought, oh, this was very nice. We should um, probably get a review committee together and then have them take a look at it. Uh -huh. And so then the question was, who should be in that review committee? Yeah. And I was at Harvard Law School prior to that. And um, I happened to know and come across um, Sir Crispin Tikhail, who was at the time a British permanent representative and ambassador extraordinaire and plenty potentially to the United Nations yes. from Great Britain. Yeah, very famous UN ambassador. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then, so I knew him and I knew a few other people. So we brought about 10 people to Woods Hole to review it. And surprisingly, they thought this is great. We should definitely have an international agreement. But then Sir Crispin Tikhail said, well, we should first of all have a general assembly resolution. Right, at the UN. At the UN. And so he went the model of um, Arvid Pardo from Malta declaring, coming to the General Assembly and wanting to declare the seas as the common heritage of mankind. Uh, not just seas, but everything, all the resources and everything that are there in it. So Sir Crispin Tikel thought that is a good idea. So he went to Malta and to a few other countries and they all thought this is a good idea. Uh, and just to fact, Fast forward, we had a General Assembly resolution declaring climate as a common concern of humanity, right. not mankind anymore, but humanity, <laughs> yeah. and not common heritage, but common concern, yeah. important you know, distinctions. And then another resolution asking for science, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its assessment. And then one more resolution on the basis of the science to begin negotiations for climate agreement. Right. <clears throat> And there were lots of other events taking place at the same time, but this is the UN sequence. Yeah. And when the UN established an intergovernmental negotiating committee uh, to have this agreement, the person appointed to lead the secretariat was a Maltese national, uh, mm -hmm. Michael Zamit Kutayar. I didn't know Michael from Adam, yeah. but Michael knew about me as the person who did this study. Right. So on the very first day of his appointment at the first negotiating session for the Framework Convention on Climate Change, he came to me and said, 
Rama, I knew the United, I know the United Nations like the back of my palm, uh, palm, uh, palm, 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 palm of my hand, but you know climate. Can you come and help me draft the framework convention on climate change? So I began my work then. Right. So you were right in at the ground floor, drafting. So at the creation of what became the UN framework convention for climate change. Exactly. And, and exactly. That, that was the beginning of it all. That was the beginning, and um, it was probably one of the most exciting periods of my uh, life. Yeah. To be able to engage with. Um, not just the bureau, but with all the member countries and with the UN system. Yes. Um, and um, there was a lot of adrenaline, lots of sleepless nights, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, lots of meetings, travels to Geneva, to New York, and to yeah. various other places. Yeah, yeah. But we did it. Yeah. We had completed in a remarkable period of time, 18 months from start to finish, finish. a framework convention on climate change was born. Wow, that's amazing. And, uh, and Sir Crispin, of course, uh, was very close to uh, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, oh, yes. as was then. And he, 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 he managed to uh, rope her into all of this, didn't That's he? right. I mean, just to, he was very close to uh, the then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. And um, um, the person I was working with, George Woodwell, had by that time testified before the Senate about how, if you don't take care of this now, how the future generations are going to be impacted by it. Yes. And I forwarded that to Sir Crispin Tikhail, and who in turn shared that with his own note to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher, I believe at that time, just had a grandchild. Um, and um, she was hosting an ozone conference in London. Right. Um, a big conference. And she surprised everybody by not only taking an active part in the ozone conference, but talking about climate change. Yes. And she was one of the first top leaders, world leaders to, to talk. And she made a very famous speech at the yeah. UN General Assembly about it. Subsequently, subsequently, yes. Subsequently That's right. Yeah. That. No, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, she, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of people were surprised how a conservative prime minister <laughs> yes. would be saying things <laughs> like that. And then, you know, there is some kind of a, a background story and then uh, you know guardian or somebody published it and then they gave credit to crispin tk yeah, as the person yeah. who did it yeah but, but then, maybe it's just the credit should be on to you <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no you know but now all that i did was to forward uh, yeah. you know my colleague's testimony before the u.s senate to you know uh, yeah, yeah. ambassador tk yeah. yeah but the, the many surprising twists and 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 turns. It's great to hear that firsthand from somebody who was uh, in, a, in a foundation. Right. So maybe uh, winding forward a bit in time, because right. a lot has happened since uh, 1987. Right. Uh, how, how do you think the, uh, the the framework process, the whole COP process, we're here at COP28, so right. that's a, right. a lot of COPs since then. Right. Uh, how, how do you think that has, uh, has, has shaped the, over the time? You know, what has been its achievements and and so that's a, an excellent question and I you know it's a very difficult question to answer because on the one hand the answer is we did terribly you know yeah. every year we continue to increase emissions so we failed the other answer is when we began negotiations at the time the chair of the intergovernmental negotiating committee who was uh, this famous Frenchman Jean Repair yes. And um, he said, I do not want any matter that is extraneous to climate. And he defined extraneous to climate as in anything that is beyond the physical causes of it. So if you have issues about north side, equity, development, no. There are other fora, you deal with them there. He didn't want anybody to talk about anything other than what the IPCC report said and what countries ought to be doing. Yeah. From there to now, you have just about every stakeholder in the world participating. As is evidenced by what we say exactly, here. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, just the blue zone, the so-called diplomatic zone, had this year... 108,000 registrations. Wow. That is on day one. I don't know how many more came since then. Yep. 108,000 registrations on day one. That does not include people that can go to green zone without accreditation. Yes. That does not include all those people that are in the city having their own various conferences at various hotels. 
you have youth groups, women groups, religious groups, trade unions, businesses, environmental agencies, uh, everyone. Okay, so the from just focusing on science and impact to making this into the most defining issue of our generation, covering every aspect of it. At the time, only ministries of environment participated. Yes. Yeah. Now you have foreign ministries, trade ministries, yeah. treasury ministries, transportation ministries, you name it. Yeah. They're all here. Yeah. Um, so, and not only that, we have <coughs> prime ministers and presidents coming in a, on a routine basis. Yes. You know, so the topic has been under constant negotiation, continue to expand its scope, bringing in more and more actors, making this into not only a defining issue of our generation, but an issue that cuts across just about every boundary that we can see. Yeah. So if you think of that as progress, yes, we have made a lot of progress. Okay. Yeah. But if you think of that as <clears throat> not going where we need to be, absolutely right. So yeah. it's both a good story and a yeah. not yeah. so yeah. good story. Now, Rama, you, you were absolutely instrumental in uh, bringing about the Ocean Pavilion mm -hmm. uh, here at uh, COP28 and previously in COP27 where we had the very first ocean pavilion and it's that's had a transformative effect on the ocean community. Right. Tell us a little bit about how that came about and yeah. uh, and what you think its impact has been. Again, you know, it is um, being at the right place at the right time, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> after I worked at the Wood Soil Research Center, I went on to work at the United Nations. Yep. Uh, United Nations Environment Program, and then I was also in Northeast Asia, uh, covering China, Japan, Russia, Mongolia, South Korea, and North Korea. Um, and I was also a designated official of the Secretary General of the United Nations. And then afterwards, I worked in the Green Climate Fund. And during the COVID, I decided to come back to the United States. My family is here, and I thought, you know, well, you know, COVID, who knows how it's going to go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, Peter de Menokel has been made Director president. Of Wolfau, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so he was uh, for 30 years faculty member at Columbia University and Dean of Sciences and um, a very distinguished career. But just as George Woodwell, way back when in 1987, roped me into negotiating climate agreement and working on climate issues, Peter wanted me to come and work at the oceanographic connecting oceans to climate solutions. And I thought this is a brilliant opportunity because I was always, uh, you know, my first real job in America was with the oceanographic institution. It is like coming full circle. So, but talking to Peter, I said, look, the oceans are important to climate. You know that and I know that. And there are lots of other people that know it. They've been talking about it, but they never went into the blue zone. You know? no, no, no. So if we're going to be serious about it, let's go into the blue zone. And the second thing I said to him was, let us not call it a HUI, Woodsoul Oceanographic Institution Pavilion. Let's have partners and let's call it Ocean Pavilion. Yes. And that was, I think, brilliant that he agreed to do that because you know, you know how institutions want their own yes, name and everything. And yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Um, and so we first had a conversation with uh, Scripps. Yes. Uh, Margaret Linen, and she was enthusiastic because she's been at it for 10 years, yes, absolutely. but always in the green zone yeah, yeah. and then, you know, shuffling, shuffling back and forth between uh, blue and green zones. But yeah. she agreed immediately. Yeah, yeah. Then we had more partners and in including you, yeah, yeah, had, you know, yeah. we are so thrilled with that. Yeah, Margaret approached me at the UN Ocean Conference in Exa Lisbon. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And then, you know, we went and talked to the AGU president yeah. and uh, so U.S. National Academy of Sciences and various others. Yeah. So they all came together. And so there was the tremendous amount of interest yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. to this issue and how we are trying to position it in the context of climate negotiations was just breathtaking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We thought we will do it once and let somebody else take it and run with it. Yeah. But not only did we want to continue it, but all of our partners, including you, Ed, yeah, uh, said, no, 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 you've done it so well, you should do it again. <laughs> do it again, yes, right. Um, and so here we are with a lot more partners. But here's one thing you may or may not know, Ed. We have now 34 partners, whereas we had 20 before. Yep. But we had requests from close to 100 
institutions. But we didn't want to take all of them. You know, we, we didn't want to take the private sector folks. Yeah. We wanted to be very judicious in terms of who we bring. And we wanted to reach out particularly to developing countries. Yeah. So we did that. And now, you know, this has not only become the place to go to. And of course, our team yeah. at Wood Solution Graphic did a fantastic job in yeah. designing the pavilion yeah. and servicing it. And also all the partners. The, the real thing about this, Ed, as you know well, is it is not seen, we don't see it as our pavilion. Right. It is our, in the broader sense of all the partners' pavilion. Yes. And not only that, you know, Prince Albert of Monaco came and made it his home for one whole day. Yeah. You know, he just sat there. He said, you know, well, if any of you want to see me, come and see me at the Ocean Pavilion. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we provided him a small office. And so he sat there and then met all these people and then yeah. came and spoke three times in one single day. And the, uh, the Secretary General of the UN, his uh, special envoy for the ocean, uh, Peter Thompson, he, he, he's living down he's here, isn't he? <laughs> Practically, yes. He says this is essential. Can't, can't do without it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, 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 that's yeah. wonderful. And, and the other thing is, I mean, we... Can, if, if this is all we did, yeah, yeah. we can be happy about it. We made yeah. a mark and you know, so on. Yeah, yeah. But you and other colleagues you know, from various institutions said, well, that's not enough. We want to really have a real impact in the negotiations. Yes. And I can tell you the text that I have seen of the global stock take now has some wonderful references to ocean. Yes. And uh, you know, it's not by having words we're going to be able to deliver on it. Yes. But this is a very good step. We yeah. have not had that kind of acknowledgement and recognition in the yeah. formal decision. Absolutely, yeah. It is not a decision yet, but yeah. you know the final draft of the version. So by yeah. tomorrow or day after, we will know, we'll know yeah. that that is the decision. But this is really a true reflection of the energy that all our partners, including yeah. you. I mean, Ed. I mean, you, you sat here for two weeks. I mean, you know. <laughs> taking part in so many meetings and all those wonderful conversations with various governments and other you know oceanographic institutions coming together and every one of them is doing exactly that right, and yeah. so that's the yeah. biggest yeah. you know selling point and uh, it's um, yeah. it's staying ability yeah and before we came here we we came together to put together the dubai uh, declaration as it's Excellent. come to be known which is calling for uh, science and observations right. to support uh, particular issues that are on the agenda here right. for, for climate change. And it's, it's amassed a large number of signatories beyond right. the Ocean Pavilion partners, hasn't it, uh, Rama? Right. I mean, so this is also a very interesting story. Um, and we thought, well, we want to make an impact in the negotiations. and uh, But then we thought, you know, if we do this beforehand, mm. you know, it would have a more of a shelf life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you and few other colleagues came together and then said, okay, let's draft a, a COP28 Dubai Ocean Declaration. And, but in drafting that, we were very judicious. We yeah. didn't want to put everything that we wanted in it. Absolutely. No, you know, no. so we looked at, okay, where are the negotiation, negotiators going? What are the texts that are before them? So we reviewed particularly the sub, substar texts and the global observations that is there. Yeah. The and substance, the scientific and technical body that advises the framework. Convention. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's, part, it's an integral part of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and advises the parties yes. uh, by translating the work of the IPCC and other scientific evidence that is coming through. So they um, had text about the ocean observations. Yeah. So we took that and then made that into something that is more equitable, uh, more broad-based. Yes. Uh, and to enable countries uh, draw from the results of what is in it yeah. uh, for their NDCs, Nationally Determined Contributions, and NAPs, National Adaptation Plans, and yeah. so on. And as you know, Ed, that has received not only the signatures from our partners, from a total of 124 institutions, not individuals. Yeah. Including the Vatican, including including the Vatican, yes. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's so, uh, that's an inclusive uh, group of people, right? Yeah. And we <coughs> we probably could have gotten a lot more, but we stopped. Yeah. You know, when the COP began, we said, okay, we've done this, we've and done so it. we'll let put a stop, stop to that. Yeah. Um, and the, the more signatures came because 
the, our partners in Pogo and okay. the, you know, the Boost. partnership for observation of the global ocean, the and, global ocean observing system. Yeah. Right, exactly. And so <coughs> both of them, you know, shared it with their uh, membership, yeah. and then you know, so yeah. it's uh, overwhelming in a manner of speaking, but it's yeah. something obviously so clearly it's, needed. It's all about these individual institutions each doing their own great work, but. Mm reinforcing the same messages and uh, coming coming together to speak with you with said one, it. with one voice so exactly that, that's, that's great yeah so um rama just a few words on uh, this is how we got to here mm -hmm. how do you see the future where where, where where are we going and particularly in the ocean space from, from here do you think well what we need to so, do so today by the way is ocean day uh, indeed so, indeed that's, that's today all, yeah. is ocean day and um, you know i'm very pleased with um, the recognition finally accorded to these issues yeah. and uh, you know I think our efforts here are paying off yeah. uh, oceans are going to be an integral part if not the central part yeah. but hopefully in the years to come yeah. it will become that yes. but we also need to make climate the integral part of ocean governance yes. those are other bodies that are taking place that yeah. is why we provided space here for the UN Ocean Conference to have a major meeting yes. with several senior leaders from various governments yes. coming together, including Costa Rica, France, and United Nations, the three entities that are going to be hosting yes. the UN Ocean Conference. Yes. Looking forward into the future, you know, we acknowledge that 2030 is a defining year. That means we have seven years. And the only way, including the IPCC, say is net negative emissions. Yeah. So we're going to peak um, at some point of time, but at that level, it's not going to keep the temperature at 1.5. Yeah. So we need to draw carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, carbon dioxide <laughs> removal becomes a key yeah. component of it, and we have to do that. And that's been a big feature of the discussions in the ocean pavilion and indeed elsewhere at, exactly. at, at COP. And that's really about getting the science into that issue because it's hugely complicated from a legal and right. economic and uh, social point of view as well as an engineering feat of enormous uh, proportions, uh, but it needs to be grounded. Absolutely. I, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head, Ed, <laughs> because it is talk of the town in a manner of speaking because lots of private sector interests yes. see that the only way countries can meet their commitment is if they invest money yes. in um, new initiatives you know yes. everything that we have tried so far yes. had gotten us to where we need to be yes. and they estimate the market to be at trillions of dollars yes. uh, in that order of magnitude yes. uh, we don't have credits to, yeah. you know, to, to produce that kind of uh, uh, reduction that yeah. we are seeking about. Yeah. So the marine CDR is becoming a big talk of the town. Yeah. This is where I think the scientific community need to really step up. Yeah. They have to say that, look, we are doing everything we can to get it right. Yeah. We want to join you in taking carbon out of the atmosphere, but we want to do it in a manner that is not going to damage the marine environment, yeah. the health of the oceans. And doesn't distract from the number one priority of getting the fossil fuel emissions. Down. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we need to first and foremost, not only continue, but intensify our efforts at mitigation, yeah. reducing emissions of fossil fuels, which means completely stopping the use of fossil fuel. Yeah. The big question here is, oh, should it be a phase down or phase out well you know it's an important question you know if you're a developing country with no other means to get energy to say to them phase out doesn't make any sense you yeah. know it is unfair unjust inequitable and all that but if we have the resources to provide to those developing countries to develop alternative sources of energy, mm -hmm. then absolutely, because no country wants to burn fossil fuel for the sake of burning fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. They want energy, yeah. uh, energy independence, energy security, for all the things that they need to get done. Yeah. So it is, I think, incumbent on 
developed countries to provide the kind of financial resources needed to developing countries. Step one. Step two, the developed countries should immediately stop fossil fuel subsidies. And step three, they have to intensify their own efforts at alternatives, whether it is wind, solar, fusion, hydrogen, you name it. And yesterday, Andrew Forrest had this wonderful reception on a board that he built uh, with 18 months of intensive research uh, that runs on ammonia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so things like that, you know, have to happen. Um, and so if it needs a little bit more time, you know, on a global basis for phase out, by all means, but we need to put all these other steps in place very rapidly. Yeah. Good. And finally, Rama, you know, your background is as a, an international lawyer, a UN diplomat, um, and yet you find yourself here in amongst a, a whole lot of scientists. So, <laughs> <laughs> how do you find that? And what's the role of the scientific community in, in, in that? What, right. And what could, we, what could we do better in this space? No, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, my, by training, I'm an international lawyer and, of course, worked in the UN and other places. But all through my life, yeah. for some reason or the other, I worked very closely with the scientists. Yeah. I was a, a lead author, coordinating lead author, coordinator of various IPCC reports, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I worked on Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, again yeah. with scientists. And working with scientists gives me um, a, a great deal of pleasure yeah. because scientists are driven by their quest for truth and then their scientific method that is devoid of oftentimes you know economic interests i mean there are some private sector companies have scientists that are driven by economic interest but leaving that aside everybody that i worked with are those kinds of uh, you know individuals and so it is a great pleasure okay. to work with them and the other thing is when we disagree we are not disagreeable you know, yes, yes, yes. we disagree because we don't agree on the method or, you know, some of the interpretations, but we can talk it out yes. and then, you know, come to a, a reasonable understanding on, you know, how to proceed. And that appeals to me a lot. Yes. You know, that's yes. something that doesn't oftentimes happen. Um, you know, I work with, you know, as you know, uh, the largest independent oceanographic institution in the world. And working with my colleagues there is exactly like that, yeah. you know, and we can sit together and then talk about these issues. And many of them have not paid particular attention to these kinds of events, but they're coming to think about more and more. Absolutely. And uh, so that's another big plus. Yeah. And I'm great. really looking forward to continuing these interactions, not only with folks in Woods Hole, but with you and other colleagues that are all partners here with our Ocean Pavilion. Until the time we really have an ensured that oceans take center stage in finding all the solutions that we need for global stabilization and for our own very survival. Well, Rama, that is uh, a real important and uh, final note to end on. Uh, Rama, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you, as ever. Uh, it's such a fascinating uh, history in terms of how you've been uh, involved in climate issues from the beginning, uh, working with scientists throughout, uh, your tremendous passion and commitment for everything that uh, that goes on in this this area and uh, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you very much for you. talking with me this uh, evening. really this is a great pleasure thank you for the time great thank, thank you bye-bye bye-bye